Okay, hello. Um, so I guess first I should discuss the midterm assignment, um, which is due a week from Tuesday. Um, Um, is there anything much I have to say about this? Um, right, so it's um, due on Canvas. Oh, wait, this is not the right assignment. This is not the right page, of course. Let's try that again. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> okay. Answer any one of the questions listed here in two to three pages, double spaced. Right. So there's four questions. You just have to answer one of them. Um, questions are key to different sections of the reading um, with the idea that each question is raised most centrally in a certain section. But you can use material from anywhere in the text to answer it. Um, and yeah, basically, like this is this is not a paper, so like you're not uh, arguing for an original thesis. You're just trying to answer my question. <laughs> um, uh, and you. Obviously, don't need to have a title or anything like that, or or bibliography. And to, you probably only need to cite Kant's text. Which, if uh, you do that, then just you use the B edition page. Um, although, if you can't figure out how to use the B edition page, uh, you can use the Kemp Smith page. Um, and um, if you do use any any other source, then obviously you need to cite it. Oh. There should be a closed parenthesis here, I believe, but there isn't. Oh, well. <laughs> Are there any questions? All right, well, you know, feel free to uh, ask, ask questions about it after you've seen the individual questions. All right. Okay, back to Kant. So, um, where we are in the book. So it's the, it's the doctrine of elements, because I said I'm going to stop writing that, because we're always going to be in the doctrine of elements. So, doctrine of elements has two parts. Actually, I did have another idea about what the elements are, based on something he said forget where, but maybe the elements are intuitions and concepts. Because at one point he says that in the general logic, the, the elements are concepts. Um, even though general logic is about concept judgments and syllogisms. I don't know, that's the plot, but in any case, yes, it may. All right, so there's a transcendental aesthetic, we finished that, the transcendental logic, the transcendental logic has two parts, the transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic. And transcendental analytic has two parts. <laughs> analytic of concepts and the analytic of principles. And the analytic of concepts has two parts. <laughs> um, so the second one is called the transcendental deduction. 
which as Kant himself says is the hardest part of the book. We haven't quite got there yet. So this part that was in the reading for day, its official title is, I think, the clue to the discovery of all pure concepts of the understanding. But um, people usually call it the metaphysical deduction. This is what Kant himself calls it um, uh, in the B edition. Uh, in the in the midst of the transcendental deduction, he he says, "Oh, in the metaphysical deduction, we showed this, and now we're doing now we're in the transcendental deduction, right?" So that is Kant uses this name metaphysical deduction for this part himself in the B edition. Presumably, that's also related to the way in the B edition he divided the uh, section on space and the section section on time into metaphysical exposition and transcendental exposition. Um, um, I'm not going to try to say exactly what metaphysical means here. And I already said uh, in general what I have to say about transcendental, although I'll say something more about what a transcendental deduction is. Um, okay, so this so this is where we are right now. Um, so what does Kant mean by analytic here? Um, I guess, in other words, before I start talking about the metaphysical deduction, I want to talk about the name of the transcendental analytic in general. What is what he means by analytic here? Um, so um, it's not the same. I mean, it's the same word as <laughs> analytic when we talk about analytic judgments or um, um, well, I guess analytic judgments, <laughs> as opposed to synthetic judgments, because in fact, the transcendental analytic is about synthetic judgments, not about analytic judgments, right? That is in the in the analytic of principles, Kant is going, the, the, the principles are judgments and Kant is going to show how we know they're true. Um, and they're all, they're synthetic, right? The, the, because we're answering the question, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? So the transcendental analytic is not about analytic judgments, but analytic, I mean, in general, right? Analytic means taking apart. Like this, this loose part in, in Greek means like untying or um, uh, dissolving, whatever, and like, on, uh, I think just kind of in, intensifies in this case. So it's, you know, it's just like taking apart. Um, so what are we taking apart? So, I mean, in an analytic judgment, you're basically taking apart the subject concept, right? That's why it's called an analytic judgment, because, you know, if you say, um, if you say all bodies are extended, and the concept of a body is the concept of an extended substance, let's say, then you're just like all you're doing is um, clarifying what pieces the the subject concept has. That's why it's called analytic. You're like taking a, taking it apart. Um, so, in, but in this case, um, Kant emphasizes in that very short paragraph that is the introduction to the transcendental analytic. Um, that what we're taking apart is not concepts, but the um, faculty or power of having concepts. That is the understanding or intellect, right? So this is, uh, 
P90. It's on page 103 in Kemp Smith. Target. All right. By analytic of concepts, I do not understand their analysis, that is the analysis of the concepts, or the procedure usual in philosophical investigations, that of dissecting the con content of such concepts as may present themselves, blah, blah, blah. Right, that is, don't expect here that I'm going to give a list of like some kind of metaphysical concepts and then like define them, analyze them. That is, say analytic things about them. We're not analyzing the concepts. What are we doing? Um, but the hitherto rarely attempted dissection of the faculty of the understanding itself. Right, so what we're doing is taking apart the faculty of understanding, so to speak, into its pieces. Um, so, those pieces are going to be pieces of our ability to form concepts. What kind of concepts? Well, like our actual concepts that we actually know things using, our empirical concepts, right? So we're going to be talking about the pieces of our ability to form empirical concepts in general. Um, And the, that's what we that's what con means by an a priori concept, I think, right? Like an a priori, just as I said before, then a priori intuition really means like um, the capability of having uh, sensible intuitions. Um, it, that is, it's not a special kind of intuition that you do before you have any experience in the a priori time. <laughs> and similarly, an a priori concept is not a concept that you start using before you have any experience. Remember, all our knowledge begins with experience. Um, and in fact, uh, in the course of the metaphysical deduction, uh, or no, sorry, in the in the lead up to the transcendental deduction, Kant is going to say that... Um, Locke performed a valuable service when he explained how it is in the course of experience that we get these concepts, right? Because there is an explanation like that. That is, we don't, um, they're not innate. <laughs> we have to go through certain experiences before we can bring them out, so to speak. But we don't derive them from experience. And we can't have derived them from experience because they're parts of the capability to form empirical concepts. Right? So we're taking apart the understanding into the fundamental a priori uh, intellectual concepts. Right? I mean, there's also the fundamental concepts of geometry and arithmetic, which are, you know, to be explained based on the transcendental aesthetic. Um, but the fundamental intellectual concepts are the pieces of the understanding itself. Um, so these fundamental pure concepts, and, and the reason, right, so we're taking apart the understanding taking it apart into fundamental pure concepts. Now, the reason I keep saying fundamental pure concepts is that Kant says that there are also derived concepts, right? That is that either by like combining some of these 
pure concepts together or combining them with mathematical concepts, we get like further a priori concepts. Um, but um, um, that is, I guess, again, less metaphorically that we have like further more specific abilities that have to do with combining the different parts of our ability to form empirical concepts. Um, but all of those can be understood just by first figuring out what the fundamental concepts are. And Kant says that in a full system of transcendental philosophy, we would list all those derived concepts as well, but that's not part of our task here, and he's he's not going to do it. Okay, so, um, so these fundamental pure concepts are automatically transcendental concepts. They're transcendental concepts um, in the sense that last time I said was the primary sense. They're um, um, prior to the actual being of any object. Um, so, like, actually, the 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 term transcendental, I. I think, um, it, I mean, the history of it is kind of murky, actually, <laughs> um, but it it appears to derive um, from some Neoplatonic interpretation of what Socrates says in the Republic. Um, this is uh, public book six. Five hundred nine B. In case you're curious. All right. So, right where Socrates says that the good is um, even beyond being and exceeds it in power. So that beyond, I think or maybe exceeds, but I think it's the beyond <laughs> is what's being translated as transcendental. Right, so like that is in Neoplatonic terminology, um, there's certain uh, um, well, I mean, you might want to call them forms, but but uh, they're prior to the forms. The first form is being, <laughs> and then there's certain uh, uh, hypostases. Right, there's there's certain uh, things I want to say, oh, that's probably not right, because they're not beings, that they're beyond being, right? So there's there's certain things that are beyond being, um, like good and one. Um, so, uh, so I think the original meaning of transcendental was just a translation of that. Now, so like in, in a Neoplatonist picture, like a general predicate is like something that's superior and has more unity to, to superior to and has more unity than the things that fall under it, right? So like if you have, you know, um, the form of horse, the individual horses Are like kind of an imperfect image or uh, emanation from this um, this truer being, the form horse, right? That's Platonic metaphysics, and so you know, and if there's more general things that horse fall under falls under, then there's something of the same relation here. I mean, there's a big difference between forms and material things, but there's something of the same relation here, right? That the form horse participates in the form being, which is higher than it, right? And so when we talk about things that are beyond being, then they're up here. So that's a 
um, platonic or neoplatonic picture, right? And Aristotelian will say, well, this isn't a metaphysical hierarchy of things. This is a order of predication, right? So like um, Scotus, when he discusses the meaning of transcendental, says that transcendental predicates are prior to being in order of predication. Right, meaning or in order of predication per se in the first mode, <laughs> technically, that it's um, that it's like um, when you say what something is, there's an order from the mo usually like in, in in the case of empirical predicates, it goes from the most specific out to the more general. Right, so the more general ones are before the more specific ones and are predicated of them. The same thing that, that in the Neoplatonist picture was represented as a metaphysical hierarchy is now like a logical hierarchy of predication. Um, so the transcendental predicates from an Aristotelian point of view are like predicates that are more general than being or something like that. Or anyway, they precede being in the way that a more general predicate precedes a more specific one. Um, and right, so sure enough, if there are concepts, so to speak, that, that are just parts of our capability of, of, of forming um, any empirical concept whatsoever, that is part of our intellectual ability of referring to any object whatsoever. So they're going to be um, um, in some sense, the most general predicates. I mean, the reason I keep saying in some sense is because we're not really, like at this point, we're not really talking about a genus of which all our individual objects are species, but um, but we're talking some, about something that, so to speak, you have to say about them before you can start saying what they are at all. So another way of saying this, which is maybe uh, seems less mysterious, is that transcendental concepts are predicates of being or of beings as such. This is another typical like medieval definition. A transcendental predicate is a predicate of being as such. And the most traditional examples of transcendental predicates are the, right? So predicate of being as such, what does that mean? Like, uh, um, 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 like, okay, some things are true of me as a body, like my size, shape, weight, right? Other things are true of me, but not, not, and, you know, since I am a body, they're true of a body, but they're not true of a body as such. They're not true of me qua body, as we might say. Um, so like, uh, hold on a second. Um, uh, like if I'm hungry, that's not a predicate of bodies as such. Right, just if I just tell you something as a body, and then ask you if it's hungry or not, it doesn't really apply. It has to be a specific kind of body, right? It has to be the kind that um, has nutrition and sensation, and it basically, it has to be an animal. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. 
right? So like this pen is neither hungry nor not hungry, but it still has weight and size, right? So predicates of being as such would be things that are true of something just because it's a being. Um, and they have to be prior to being in order of predication because um, since like being can't be, so to speak, part of its own definition, there it would be circular. So like these things can't themselves count as beings, even though being counts as them. So let me uh, let me try to hopefully make this a little bit more understandable what I'm saying by um, by going to the most traditional examples. And these are the ones that Kant discusses in section 12. So the, the end of the reading for today. Um, This is B113. This is a this is text that was added in the B edition, right? See how there's only B numbers in the margin? Okay. So the section numbers were also added in the B edition. The A edition doesn't have those section numbers. Okay, so it starts in the transcendental philosophy of the ancients, there is included yet another chapter containing pure concepts of the understanding. So I mean. Right, one here, right here is a piece of my evidence that that Kant claims to be using transcendental in a traditional way, because the concepts that he calls transcendental, he's assuming are that he's just listed in the previous sections. He's assuming that um, uh, those were or should have been or uh, part of the transcendental philosophy of the ancients. Now he's saying, but the ancients actually had added some other concepts here. And by the ancients, I think he means the ancient Neoplatonists. He doesn't, he, uh, as far as I can tell, Kant makes the same distinction between ancient and um, medieval or scholastic philosophy that we do. So by ancients, he means what we would call ancient philosophers. In the Transcendental Philosophy of the Ancients, there is included yet another chapter containing pure concepts of the understanding, which, though not enumerated among the categories, must, on their view, be ranked as a priori concepts of objects. And let me just skip that. They are propounded in the propositions so famous among the schoolmen. So now he's talking about medievals. Quod libet ens est unum verum bonum. Um, any being whatsoever, whatever being you like, right? But any being whatsoever is one true good, right? So these are the um, these are the most traditional examples. These are called the convertible transcendentals. Um, let me just. I think I need this. Actually, I'm going to write them. This one true and good. These are co the convertible transcendentals. What does convertible mean? Well, they're convertible with being, and convertible uh, means that um, whatever is a being is, for for example, whatever is a being is one, and whatever is one is a being. Right, so they are coextensive with being, is might be another way of putting it. So these convertible transcendentals, um, um, Kant uh, says, don't really belong in his list of transcendental concepts. Um, that is, they're not really part of the what's results when we analyze the understanding in this way. Um, and he explains the reason that is, um, uh, 
Um, here we go. So this is the bottom of B113, top of B114. On, this is all on page 118 in Kemp Smith. I'm not sure if I said that before. These supposedly transcendental predicates of things are, in fact, nothing but logical requirements and criteria of all knowledge of things in general. Right, so he's saying that these are subjective requirements. Um, they're 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 part of um, they're logical, meaning I guess like general logical or formal logical, rather than transcendental logical. They're they're not um, aspects of the way the understanding must be able to represent an object. They are aspects of the way the understanding must be regarded as a faculty of the subject. So that's why they're not going to be on the list. But that doesn't mean they're not important, actually. In fact, they they come back again in the transcendental deduction and then again in the paralogisms. Much later, there's a reference to them. Um, and I guess chronologically that reference came first right because the uh this section and the and that remark in the transcendental deduction that i'm talking about are only from the b edition but the discussion of what i take to be the same thing in the paralogisms is in both the a and the b edition so that was what he wrote about them first actually um okay um, so, but anyway, so these aren't going to be, right, these convertible transcendentals. What these pens are giving out? So these convertible ones are important, but they're not what Kant is trying to list in this section. Okay, but as I said, these are the most traditional examples and like, right, these two are found in Plato, in the Republic and in the Parmenides. Um, this one, at least under this name seems to be medieval, but um, in, like, um, but it's at least as Thomas Aquinas explains these two, you know, this one means that everything um, is in is adequately represented by the divine intellect. Right. So like in the case of our intellect, we we say that like our representation is true if it matches the object. But for the divine intellect, that's backwards because the divine intellect is the cause of its object. Right. So in, in that case, you say the object is true because it matches the representation and the object always matches the representation. Right. So everything is true. That's why this is a convertible transcendental. And. This means that everything matches its representation that the divine will. Okay, so, but in addition to these convertible transcendentals, in, um, according to a lot of people like Neoplatonists and Scotists and perhaps Thomas himself, although the, the Thomistic doctrine is that these are the only transcendental, well, actually there's two others, but race and aliquid. I won't go into that. All right. Um, but according to a lot of people, there's another group of transcendentals, which are called the disjunctive transcendentals. And the disjunctive transcendentals, so an example is finite and infinite, right? So they say that every being as such has to be either finite or infinite. So finite and infinite are predicates of beings as such, even though not every being is finite and not every being is infinite. And also on that list um, may go uh, go things like cause and effect and substance and accident. So Kant's categories 
apparently are supposed to correspond to that other chapter right so there's like the chapter of the transcendental philosophy of the ancients that discussed these conscious saying doesn't have a place here but the fundamental pure concepts of the understanding that Kant is going to discuss correspond to those disjunctive transcendentals. So it's the other chapter of the philosophy of the ancients. Um, and... Um, Kant only appears to change the description of what this is going to be a list of in slightly. So, because remember, I said, so like one thing which I think would apply to Kant and these medieval people is that they're prior to being in order of predication. But another way of describing it is that they're predicates of beings as such. So um, instead, Kant says something slightly different. So skipping ahead, this is on B236, and it's page 294 in Kemp Smith. Um, This is actually not part of the assigned reading for this course, although it's interesting. It's it's part of the discussion of the table of nothing, <laughs> where Kant lists all four types of nothing and discusses them. But anyway, so he says, all we need is this. The categories are the only concepts prefer to objects in general, right? So the categories, which I guess, keep saying this without having officially introduced it, right? This is what Kant is going to call categories. These fundamental pure concepts, pure objective concepts of the understanding that we're going to dissect the understanding into, Kant calls categories. And he says in that thing I just read that categories are refer to objects in general. Right, so instead of de defining them as predicates of beings as such, he's defining them as predicates of uh, as of objects as such. Um, and I think like the reason for the change will become clear much later, but it's basically the same thought. Um, now, why are they called categories? Well. Um, let me write categories here. Have I got the bad pen here? Right. Why are they called categories? Well, um, so the term category comes from Aristotle. If you took 100A, I'm sure uh, you read like the beginning of Aristotle's categories. I also, if you took 100B with me last quarter, we also read the beginning of Aristotle's categories. Um, there's a list of, and there's some kind of fundamental classification of um, things or words or something, and they're called categories. And Kant, um, in this case, explicitly says, right, because he says, you know, Aristotle had a list of categories, but he didn't do it right, and I'm going to give the right list. So it's supposed to be the same use of the word category. By the way, so I just said I should make clear to just to begin with that um, this is obviously is a special technical use of the term category, right? It would be confusing to think, to try to understand this in terms of like categorizing. Um, uh, 
it's, you know, category means pure fundamental concept of understanding. Now, okay, so like, uh, um, if you have studied Aristotle's categories, you might have a hard time uh, seeing how this is supposed to be the same thing. And in fact, like, it's pretty another traditional description, medieval description of transcendental predicates is that transcendental predicates um, apply to members of all categories, or at least more than one category, right? So it seemed like the categories couldn't be transcendental predicates by that definition. Um, so the answer is, um, uh, you have to interpret Aristotle the right way to get this continuity here. And it's basically a scotist interpretation of Aristotle. Um, and I like I don't I don't think I have time to it's too complicated to explain here. But one thing that you can see is that so now I'm gonna start saying what the categories are. So there's four. Okay, sometimes, let me put it this way. And Okay, so this is how I like to draw the categories. Um, actually, I won't have room at all. <laughs> I can't hear this anything. All right. Let me write those back up again. So there's four um, sometimes Kant, Kant calls these four headings of the categories. And when you call these headings of the categories, you call then each one has three categories under it. And so that on this way of understanding it, there's 12 categories total, right? Four times three. But other times he seems to call these things the categories. And then, he, then he'll call these the moments of the category. That use of the word moment, not sure where it comes from. Um, it's, uh, uh, um, but it's where Hegel gets his constant use of the word moment, <laughs> right? It comes from Kant's use of the word moment for these three things here, which, as I said, I don't know where Kant got it from. It it doesn't obviously mean something like a very short period of time or something. Right? It's probably more closely related to the use of moment when we talk about the moment of inertia or something like that, but it's not exactly the same as that either, obviously. Anyway, so like, so I'm sorry to confuse things to begin with, but it's but but this is just the way it is. Sometimes there's four categories, each of which has three moments. Sometimes there's 12 categories. Or actually, I think what's most what happens most often. And this makes it even more confusing, is that Kant will, going through a list of the categories, will go quantity, quality, and then he'll start listing the moments under here. Um, in other words, as if there were eight categories, right? One, two, and then six here. <laughs> Um, so, um, there's probably a reason for that. This distinction here is what Kant calls the distinction between mathematical and dynamical categories. For some reason, in this case, the, the, the individual moments are not worth discussing on their own, whereas in this, these cases they are. Um, okay, but, so the reason I'm writing this all up right away, though, is that Aristotle's list of categories begins, well, it begins with substance. So substance is, turns up in the here, like 
the first moment of the category of relation is substance accident. Um, but it's not one of these headings. But after that, the next three categories in Aristotle are quantity, quality, and relation. Modality is not one of Aristotle's categories. Um, um, but it may relate to one of the others. Um, in fact, I may relate to action and passion. So, I mean, this way of cutting down the list of categories um, is content is not the first one to do this. Like Plotinus, who was the founder of Neoplatonism, also offers basically at some point the same list. He says, you know, really the only categories we need are substance, quantity, quality, relation, and action and passion. And Leibniz repeats the same things, the same thing on the new essay, in the new essay, new essays on the human understanding, right? His response to Locke also gives a list of categories and said, these are the only ones we need really with, with substance again. So, um, so I think Kant um, really is trying to um, reproduce and then fix up Aristotle's list of categories under some understanding of Aristotle. Okay, okay, so, and someone said, for clarification, each of these categories or moments are the only instances of pure concepts. Well, no, as I said, because first of all, there's mathematical concepts, which are also pure concepts. At least they're pure a priori, con yeah, I mean, they, they, yeah, they're pure a priori concepts, although, um, um, Maybe sometimes he uses pure in a way that excludes them. You realize pure is a relative term, right? That is, when you when I say something is pure, uh, you you have to ask me pure from what, right? Like what isn't in it? You know, like pure soup is not pure water, <laughs> um, because it doesn't have anything in it but soup, but it has stuff in it that's not water. <laughs> Right. So, so Kant uses pure, like, uh, in different contexts to mean pure of different things. But, but in any case, you know, so they're not the only pure a priori concepts. There's, there's mathematical concepts. And then, as I said, there's these derived concepts, right? He lists a few of them in section, uh, I don't know, right after the, the list of the categories, he lists a few of the derived ca uh, uh, concepts. I think he says one of them is force. Um, so he's saying that's also a pure a priori concept, but it's not fundamental. Does that, does that help? Am I answering what you're asking? Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Okay, and so uh, the the two parts of, so the analytic of concepts is, the aim of the analytic of concepts is to um, get this list of concepts and show that we have a right to this list of concepts, that is, that these concepts are objectively valid, that is, that they have an object, that we succeed in referring using these concepts. That's the aim of the, the analytic of concepts. Then the analytic of principles is going to, building on that, show that certain principles must be true. Because roughly speaking, if you deny that principle, then you would find that one of the categories can't apply to the object of experience, which we've just shown is impossible. They must apply. Right. So, um, so of those two, so that going back to the analytic of concepts, as I said, it's, there's two things we need to do. We need to get the list of pure fundamental concepts, and then we need to show 
that they're objectively valid. So basically the metaphysical deduction that is the reading for today is the first one of those. And the transcendental deduction is the second one. So the metaphysical deduction is just about saying what are the fundamental concepts that we're dealing with here. And that's why this is the part that contains the table of categories, the list of all of them, right? Because this is where you're supposed to figure out what they are. Um, okay, so how are we supposed to get this list? Well, um, so it's basically, it's, uh, so remember, what we're trying to do is get a list of the ways we must be able to represent things if we're able to form empirical concepts. Now, we haven't shown that we are able to form in empirical concepts, right? So it's like, so to speak, if we, um, if we have any fundamental pure, pure concepts, they have to be these. <laughs> Um, uh, again, I think the transcendental deduction is how is the transcendental deduction going to show that these are objectively valid? It's going to show basically that um, there must be an empirical object. We must succeed in representing some empirical object. But so at this point, we're, we don't have any guarantee of that, but we're just asking what would we need to do if, if we could represent an empirical object? Um, um, So an empirical concept is an empirical general rule under which different cases can in principle be brought, right? So there's one rule to which many possible cases may correspond. So the what we're looking for here is a list of um, um, the fundamental kinds of unity of rule to which many different cases can correspond. And this is what Kant calls functions. And I, this is another word that I wish I knew where it came from. Um, I'm sure it comes from somewhere. I mean, Kant is in general actually opposed to introducing new terminology unless you absolutely have to. He talks about that explicitly. I'm sure it comes from somewhere. I thought it might come from like uh, civil law terminology, but I couldn't find anything there and I don't really know. But anyway, um, so where is this that I was going to read? That's on the next page. B70, no, B93 on page 105. Here it is. By function, I mean the unity of the act of bringing various representations under one, I crossed out one and wrote A, it doesn't make that much difference. Under, it's hard to tell in German when you are when you have the number one and when you have the indefinite article. But anyway, um, by function, I mean the unity of the act of bringing various representations under one common representation. Mm. 
right? So that, that's what I said. We're looking for the fundamental ways that um, a rule has to be able to unify to to um, constitute an empirical concept. Um, so what that means is that the the categories themselves are not like directly rules for unifying what's given in sense. They're um, they're aspects of the ability to unify what's given in sense. Um, Right, so I think Kant says this again. Let me skip ahead to show where he says this. This is B two eighty eight. It's on page two fifty three in Kemp Smith. The categories are not themselves knowledge or cognition, but are merely forms of thought for the making of knowledge from given intuitions. That is, I take it, forms of thought. Um, Oh, I didn't know. It's a long time ago. Sharon, I guess, if that's how you pronounce that. I mistakenly assumed pure meant not empirical. Well, I mean, I think it does basically, right? Like those other concepts I listed, like the mathematical concepts are also not empirical, according to Kant. The difference between the mathematical concepts and the categories is not that one is empirical and the other isn't. It's like what faculty they have their basis in. Is it in the pure form of intuition? So we know a priori that, that things must fall into these concepts because everything that we sense must come in under the form of pure intuition or are they? do they belong to the understanding? Okay, but anyway, sorry, let, I just noticed that in the chat was why I suddenly started talking about that. Let me go back to what I was talking about before, right? That um, they're, right, when Kant says they're um, forms of thought, um, in Duncan Foreman, right, he means that I think that they, they're aspects of the formal reality of thought. <laughs> Um, so, uh, like they're aspects of what reference to an object is like, they're not ob aspects of the objects that we're referring to, not directly. Um, but nevertheless, the objects that we're referring to will have to conform to them in the sense that since like these are the fundamental ways of representing an empirical object. Every empirical concept has to be able to represent its object that way. So actually, let me give you, let me, uh, I wasn't planning to do this, but let me give you an example right away. So that, um, you may notice that one occurs twice in them. That's exactly what Kant is gonna talk. Well, Kant already talks about that in section 12, right? Where he says, that this, this is like a, a subjective qualitative version of the first moment of the category of quantity. And the transcendental deduction is gonna again say, we're not dealing with the category of unity here. We have to look for a higher form of type of unity. And then he refers back to section 12. Right, so, um, but the category of unity so in what sense does every empirical concept have to be able to represent its object as one? Well, like take the empirical concept cinnabar. One thing it has to be able to do is represent all cinnabars the same thing, cinnabar. That's the sense in which one is part of, so whatever the rule of cinnabar is, 
part of it being a rule that applies to many different cases is to represent all those cases as the same. Whereas the next moment is plurality, right? And that's gonna be the fact that on the other hand, a rule that um, applies to many different cases has to be able to represent them as not all the same. <laughs> right, so every empirical concept is gonna represent its object as one or is gonna be, can be used in a certain context to represent its object as one and can be used in a certain concept context to represent its object as many. And I think the same thing is supposed to be true for all of these categories. Okay, so um, are there more questions yet? before I go on. Okay, so the analytic of concepts actually, so I mean, so far all we know, all I've told you is that we have to find somehow a list of all the ways that a single rule has to be able to represent the many cases that correspond to it. How are we going to know if we found all of those? Where are we going to look for them? I mean, even if you buy what I said about these two, how do we know where to find any more? So the analytic of concepts begins with the promise that unlike Aristotle, he says, Right. So he says Aristotle just picked up his list of categories where every, you know, like as they occurred to him, sort of. Um, not every interpreter of Aristotle would agree with that. Uh, it's hard to, given the nature of Aristotle's writing, it's hard to tell when, when he actually has a principle and when he doesn't. <laughs> but in any case, so Kant says, yeah, Aristotle just like wrote down some fundamental things as they occurred to him, but we're not going to do that. This is a science and it's a, it's going to be a complete science because so science is like not like empirical science, right? It's like mathematics is a science, it's that kind of science, right? So it's it's going to be a complete science. We're going to be able to finish it because it's not about the objects of the understanding, which are many and various, and we'll never get to the end of them. It's just about the dissection of the understanding itself. And so we should be able to finish it. And he claims basically that this table finishes it. And he says, in order to be sure of that, we need to not just write them down as they occur to us, we need to have a principle that we're getting them from. And what is the principle? So the principle is somehow that each category or moment of a category corresponds to a um, function of the understanding and judgment. So that's why before you get the table of categories, you first get a table of judgments. Hopefully I've made these boxes big enough. Probably haven't. I would like to write the judgment and the corresponding category in each box, right? So the functions of judgment here are universal, particular, and singular. And then here, affirmative, negative, and infinite. The third one is always the weird one. <laughs> and then uh, categorical. This is yet another use of the third category. Categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. And finally, problematic. 
That's the rhetoric. If you can't read what I wrote here, um, I mean, first of all, you could just look in the book because I'm just copying from God's table, but also, um, um, second, um, share screen. Uh, right for so here's here's this course here's the syllabus um and right here is a bonus table of categories right so i've written here maybe this is better than writing on the board just showing this to you <laughs> right, I've written here italicized the name of the judgment that goes in each spot. Universal, particular, singular. Right, so universal judgment is a judgment like all cinnabar is red. Particular judgment is a judgment like some cinnabar is shiny. Singular judgment is a judgment like this cinnabar weighs five grams. Um. You notice I've written the tra the convertible transcendentals up here. Um, and here I've written the Neoplatonic names for the three moments. <laughs> Permanence, procession, and reversion. Um, okay, uh, categorical judgment is like all cinnabar is red, a hypothetical. So, okay, so, so notice what I just said, right? Like a universal, all cinnabar is red is a universal judgment. It's an affirmative judgment, it's a categorical judgment, and it's an assertoric judgment. Right, so these they, these aren't 12 different types of judgment. Rather, it's like you have to pick one from each column for a, every judgment you have. Whether every combination is possible is not so clear. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, uh, right, so here, I mean, I take it, well, yeah, I don't want to try to say what each of these type of judgments are. Some of them are tricky, especially infinite. Kant tries to explain what the difference between negative and infinite judgments are, and he gives examples, but unfortunately, it seems like there's a problem in the text there. <laughs> like he seems to give the same example as examples of both or something like that, and there seems to be like a knot in the wrong place or whatever, so it's very confusing. Um, categorical, all cinnabar is red, hypothetical, if blah, 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 then all cinnabar is red, disjunctive, either all cinnabar is red or something else. And, prob and these problematic means that I'm just uh, um, entertaining the judgment for the sake of argument, so to speak, but I'm not asserting that it's true. Whereas assertoric means I'm asserting that it's true. And apodictic means that I claim to have shown that it's necessary, right? Apodictic is the Greek version of the Latin demonstrative, right? So it's a, a demonstrative proposition. It's interesting, by the way, that Kant often seems to prefer Greek terminology, not always. There's plenty of Latin terminology in, the, in this table, obviously, but he often will, will take the Greek equivalent of something that you usually would see people say in Latin. Why? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like, this table is super important. Both the judgment version of it and the concept version of it. That is the actual table of categories. Um, I like to write it this way. Kant always writes it in this weird kind of diamond shape. Um, there must be something important about that, but I don't understand it. So I won't say why he does that. Um, and where's the stop sharing button? Let's go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing for now. Maybe I'll go back to that. Okay, so somehow we're supposed to get from these types of judgments. Now, like, it's not... People often, I think Hegel already criticizes Kant this way. Hegel says, well, this just pushes the question back one step. Where, Kant, where did you get this list of form of judgments? And Hegel says, oh, you just picked it up from the logic manuals. Now that, that last claim, although you often hear it re re repeated, is not exactly fair because as Kant himself points out, this is, although like a lot of these things are traditional, there's some things that aren't. And Ray, like he's, he's had to change things in order to fill out this table and make it this shape. But of course that just makes it a uh, harder question. So how do we know, Ray, like how do we know that we've got all the forms of judgment or all the functions of the judgment and understanding? And why is it easier to know that? than it is to know what all the fundamental pure concepts of the understanding are. Okay, all right, so yeah, these, I know this is very hard to read, but um, first of all, it's just, it's from the book and it's also in the table I was just showing. So this says assertoric, I mean, I would guess a lot of these others are pretty illegible too. Like this is supposed to say hypothetical. <laughs> That's an H, the P, the T. You're gonna be in there somewhere. <laughs> this is an A, a D, no, a? letters. Anyway. <laughs> I think the, the terms were made clear when you shared the other chart. All right. So I won't I, I won't put up that's a chart. And someone else says, so Kant doesn't explain where, how he gets these in the transcendental deduction. No, because as I said, I think the transcendental deduction, the metaphysical deduction is supposed to is, is supposed to be where he tells you where he gets the list. The transcendental deduction then goes with that list, right? So again, like as the as, as I understand it, and everything I'm saying here is controversial. I mean, I could say that probably before every sentence I say in this whole course. <laughs> Um, but at least as I understand it, the metaphysical deduction says, um, these are the concepts we would have to be able to apply if we had an empirical object. And then the transcendental deduction tries to prove that we must have an empirical object. And like, um, like spoiler alert, but the, the object we must, the object I must have is going to turn out to be myself as an empirical object. Right. Um, so that's why I said before that the transcendental deduction is really Kant's version of Descartes' cogito argument, even though it works out very differently than Descartes' argument, but it's really Kant's version of it. Okay, but moving back to the metaphysical deduction, right, so the, the principle or clue is supposed to be that somehow suppose we know that these are all the functions of the understanding and judgment, from that, we can figure out what the categories have to be. So, um, right, as he says, let me switch back to, oops, get too many things up there. Oh, I did it, okay. So this is B104. This is one of the most famous sentences in the book. Um, it's the bottom of B104. Oops. It's on page 112 in Kemp Smith. The same function which gives unity to the various representations in a judgment also gives unity to the mere synthesis of various representations in an intuition. Wait, could you, you couldn't see what I was pointing to, could you? 
Let me do it again. The same function which gives unity to the various representations in a judgment also gives unity to the mere synthesis of various representations in an intuition. That's supposed to be the clue, as Kant puts it, right? That's that's going to be the clue to the discovery of all the pure concepts of the understanding. What does that mean? <laughs> well, so what is the unity of the various representations in a judgment? Now, I mean, let's think to begin with, but I mean, part of the problem is going to be that what that certain ways of understanding it will only work for this simple case and not for other cases. Right? Let's let's say that to begin with, that we're dealing again with a universal affirmative categorical assertoric judgment, like all cinnabar is red. So we have two concepts: the subject concept and the predicate concept. So what is the unity of various representations in a judgment? And you might think it means like putting these two concepts together. Now, if that's right, whereas, so, okay, what is the unity of the, what is giving unity to the mere synthesis of various representations in an intuition? Well, um, So he's been talking about this in the paragraph just above. What must first be given with a view to the a priori knowledge of all objects is the manifold of pure intuition. The second factor involved is the synthesis of this manifold by means of the imagination. So that's mere synthesis, right? So there's what is manifold in the intuition, the manifoldness of the intuition, the fact that it isn't unified. Then there's the mere synthesis of what is manifold in the intuition, which is performed by the imagination, whatever that is. Even this does not yet yield knowledge, the concepts which give unity to this pure synthesis and which constitutes so, sorry, and which consists solely in the representation of this necessary synthetic unity furnish the third requisite for the knowledge of an object and they rest on the understanding, right? So when in the very next sentence, he talks about the function of the understanding in giving unity to the mere serious uh, synthesis of various representations in an intuition. We have a picture, something like this. So here's the intuition. The intuition is manifold. Um, oops, oops, switch. The intuition is manifold. Um, when Kant talks about the manifold of or in an intuition, so manifold or um, manish faltige, <laughs> manish faltish, uh, but then it, it gets endings. Is really it's really an adjective. It's an adjective being used as a noun. Um, I mean, we do this sometimes in English, although not very often. But it, it's like when you talk about the manifold in the in an intuition, it's like talking about the good in someone, not like talking about the liver in someone. 
<laughs> right? So when you talk about the liver in someone, you're you're using liver as a noun, and you're saying the liver is in that person. If you want to say, see the liver in that person, you'd like open them up and find the liver. Right. When you say see the good in this person, you mean see that which is good in them or such, right? Or that respect in which they are good. Or the the good aspect of them. So you're really using good as an adjective, and then and the, the noun it's modifying is just left off. Right? That which is adjective, good. So um in German, you can tell which you're doing because adjectives. Um, take case endings that nouns don't. So in fact, when you use a noun this, when you use an adjective this way, it gets capitalized because it's being put in the place where a noun would go, but it still gets its adjective endings. And that's the case with the word that Kant is using here, right? So the manifold in an intuition means what is manifold in the intuition or the respect in which the intuition is manifold. Where manifold just means not one, right? Um, are there questions about what I just said? Because it's, I mean, it's easy to start thinking about the manifold in an intuition as like the manifold in a car engine. Like the intuition has a thing in it called the manifold, but that's not, that's, that's not a correct understanding, I think. Okay, so, so the intuition is manifold. The imagination does something which we're calling mere synthesis. It's mere synthesis as opposed to unity of synthesis or synthetic unity, which is the which is what the understanding does. So the understanding is supplying unity to the mere synthesis of the manifold in an intuition or of an intuition is somehow supplying unity to all this manifold stuff. This again is a, like a, I could, I could kind of relabel things a little bit, and this would be a picture of Plotinus's metaphysics. <laughs> all right, so um, where where being involves unity and ma and and manifoldness and whatever. Okay, but. Um, but the point I'm making here is, or the point I'm trying to get to here is, if we're if we're saying this function is the same as this function, then I mean they're obviously not really the same, right? I mean it's two different, completely different types of things that are being unified. So all you can say is, I guess, that there's some kind of analogy. And this is the way it's usually understood. And it's the way I used to try to understand it. And there are textual reasons for trying to understand it that way. I mean, for sure, there are some times when Kant talks about the multiple representations in a judgment. And he means the, the concepts that are being joined in the judgments. Um, but I don't think that's what he means here. Um, so what does he mean? Well, um, so let me go back to another fam famous sentence a few pages earlier. So this is B93. It's on page um, 105 in Kemp Smith. Um, Where is this? Oh, I guess it starts here, but it, it, it goes from 105 to 106 in Kemp Smith. Accordingly, all judgments are functions of unity among our representations. Instead of an immediate representation, a higher representation, which comprises the immediate representation and various others, is used in knowing the object, and thereby much possible knowledge is collected into one. What does that mean? <laughs> so again, it's controversial. Sometimes people say, this is the higher representation. 
we use this higher representation in representing the object. So like if this is cinnabar, and if, if, if this Desmond is all cinnabar is red, this concept is a concept cinnabar, and this concept is a concept red. And we use this concept, which applies to this one and many others. And so, and this is the part where it doesn't exactly make sense. Much possible knowledge is collected into one. I mean, I mean, of course, there's other possible judgments of which this is the. Pre I wrote these letters wrong. This is the subject, and this is the right. Right. This. Well, anyway, that was my idea. <laughs> I'll explain why in a second. So this predicate red, of course, you know, features in many other possible judgments. Fire engines are red. Whatever. Right. Um, but. Uh, that doesn't combine much possible knowledge into one. Ray, when I say all cinnabar is red, that's all it says. It doesn't say that any, doesn't combine any other forms of knowledge there. But what it does combine is this. So instead of an immediate representation, what's an immediate representation? An immediate representation is an intuition. Mm -hmm. In the, so um, if I could, so to speak, know things without making judgments, how would I have to do it? And the answer is I would have to do it one intuition at a time, <laughs> right? Um, but instead of doing that, the way knowledge actually works is but instead of the immediate representation, I use a higher representation. And thereby much possible knowledge is combined into one. So the much possible knowledge is like, this is red, this is red, this is red, this is red, this is red. <laughs> I've combined it into one in my judgment, all cinnabar is red. And then I think if you think about this carefully, you can see that it's not just an analogy. It's literally the same function, right? So take the easiest case, as Scott always, himself always does, <laughs> of unity, right? So what is it that allows me to apply the predicate red to the subject cinnabar in a universal judgment? Well, as I was saying before, um, the, um, the concept cinnabar can represent all cinnabars the same. So I take it all as the same, and then I apply the, the predicate red to it. And that's a universal judgment. Whereas, How do I make a particular judgment? Some cinnabar is shiny. Now I have to use the concept cinnabar to represent cinnabar as a plurality. Right, for it to be possible that some of it is and some of it isn't. Now, of course, if some of it is, it might be that all of it is, right? But, um, but that, but the specific content of saying that some of it is is like only some of it is. Some of it might not be right. And so, at this at that moment, I'm representing a cinnabar as as self different, as Hegel would put it, right? As more than one thing. That's the function that of unity that I'm using the to. Um, It's the um, aspect of my ability to collect a manifold under a single, what is manifold under a single rule. The aspect that in doing that, um, uh, because the rule is a rule that applies to many possible cases, I always represent its object as not only the same as itself, but also as different from itself. 
that very same function is what allows me to apply a predicate in a particular judgment. Some cinnabar is shiny. And finally, and this I think helps to explain a number of things like why, which Kant himself says, in, I guess section 11, which is also added in the B edition, but it's surprising that there's three moments. You might think there should only be two. You, should, you might think that 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 the classification of a priori concepts should always be by dichotomy, but instead there's always a third. What's this third one doing here? And how is it different from unity or plurality? And how is it, as Kant also says in section 11, he says the third one is always a combination of the first two. So the combination of unity and plurality is that I'm taking an object that's different from itself and then in that difference, considering it again as one. So if I could do that with Cinnabar in general, that would mean like I could re I could kind of like take all the possible different Cinnabar and then consider it in that difference as one big whole one totality. But of course, I can't do that. And Kant says that these third categories, we like we never have an absolute version of them in empirical knowledge. We always have only a relative or conditioned version of them. And so this is the kind of conditioned version we can have. I take some plur plurality of cinnabar I stop at a certain point. It's not all Cinnabar. <laughs> and I add it up. And then I can apply a predicate to it. And if you say, wait, isn't that the, this the same as applying a universal predicate only to a smaller universal or something like that? No, because, and that's why as my example, I use this Cinnabar weighs five grams. Ray, this cinnabar weighs five grams doesn't mean that it's everywhere in it, it weighs five grams. The way this cinnabar is red means everywhere in it, it's red, right? This cinnabar weighs five grams means that if you kind of like spread it out and then add it all back together, all that totality receives the predicate weighs five grams. And that's the way we can represent uh, singular. I mean, th that is, that's the kind of predicate that singular empirical judgments have, right? That's why, why way back when I said what singular judgments are, I said, like, instead of thinking Socrates is mortal, you should think something like this human is mortal. This human is mortal is also a weird case because because there's a natural unit of human. You don't just start in an arbitrary place. Right, like half of Socrates is not a human. Socrates plus Plato is not a human. <laughs> right. So there's something weird about concepts of living things and whatever, but that's why I like to use an example like Cinnabar. <laughs> um, um, okay. Uh, I see I only have one minute left. Um, but I think I actually said everything important here. I wanted to say something more about the structure of the table. Um, maybe that will come up again later. Um, but I, I think like these are the, the, this is, I've said what's important, like my understanding of where this table comes from and what the clue is supposed to be that relates one to the other. And I guess I guess I, guess I should say one more thing that like, but I don't know exactly how to do this. Hopefully, if you then think about the function of the understanding and the judgment this way, it would somehow come out easily that these are the functions of the understanding and judgment. And then you could use that easy result to get the categories, which is hard, 
right? Which is Kant's assumption here, right? He says, like, how do we find the list of categories? Well, here's the list of judgments. And it's that seems like it's so easy that he doesn't even have to say where it comes from. And then now we can use it to solve this other problem. So I like I wish I could explain how just from looking at this, I mean, I think I can kind of explain how just from looking at this, you could get that these are the functions of the understanding and judgment. But the thing is, like that argument doesn't seem more obvious than the argument that these are the functions of judgment in, in bringing unity to the mere synthesis of a manifold and an intuition. So uh, it can't be right because, again, that's one is supposed to be easier than the other. That's what I can't explain. Anyway, that's all I have time for. And I will see you um, hopefully tomorrow. Remember, there's a makeup lecture tomorrow um, at the same time. And of course, if you can't come, you can always watch the recording. So hopefully I will see you then. Bye.